Mettimi qua la, eh, la, la campanella, ok. La borsa. Uh, can you hear me? Ah, oh, wow. Can you hear me? Excellent. I'm sorry for being here, but I just got back to take my papers. Voilà. Okay. My name is Simona Rinaldi. Uh, I'm from the European Chinese Foundation, as you can imagine. Um, I know some of you. So um, I'm very happy to welcome you here in presence and also a big hello and a big welcome to the participants that are joining us in a remote via the streaming and uh, why we are actually here in Pollenzo. Where we are, in fact, we are here is uh, where the University of Gastronomic Science is, is the headquarter. This is actually um, a place where also the Food for Slow movement, movement was born. And we thought it was nice to bring you here to see how historical background, the beauty, the excellence can really drive the change and can really develop the territory. So this is why we are here and you will know more about Poland. And so without adding any other word, I would like to pass the floor to our director of the European Training Foundation, Xavier Mateo de Cortada. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, on behalf of the, the, the ETF, the European Training Foundation, I want to welcome all of you to this event, the Skills Lab Net. We have been working on defining why, how, and who to be part of this uh, network for some time. <coughs> and I'm very happy to see that it is already a reality and that is launching, uh, the, the plane is uh, taking off. And uh, that is the excitement that I think we all feel in this opening. First of all, uh, let me thank you all for having traveled to Torino, to Polenzo and also for uh, those who are following us in stream. This is the first live event of this Skills Life Network of Experts, but it's also the first live event that we organize after the pandemic hit in 2020. And during these two years, we learned new ways of uh, working and we try to take the, the best of it. But we also realize how important it is to uh, meet together uh, with colleagues and peers in person to learn, discuss, uh, challenge each other, and ultimately grow together. We are now, uh, we now value this even more than ever before. This is therefore the first annual live event of this network where the members can meet in person exchange and decide future plans. The network, as you know, was launched only in October 2021, but it's growing fast and uh, we hope that it can become a point of reference for the research community working on skills demand analysis. It includes now already 100 members coming from the, all the European Training Foundation partner countries and beyond. I'm very pleased to see today represented here almost all the ETF partner countries and also some of researchers from the member states, the European Union member states. It is important to build bridges between the research community in Europe with the one of uh, its neighboring region as uh, this gives an opportunity to learn, exchange and find synergies. I'm also pleased to see friends from international organizations and agencies such as the, the GRC, the Joint Research Center, Eurofound, UNIDO, and the Union for the Mediterranean. It is important to have you here today because by working together as international community, we can boost impact and change in countries. The Skills Lab Network of Experts is a tool for knowledge co-creation on emerging skills needs. As you know, it is open to all researchers, research institutes from expertise networks, from ETF partner countries, and from the EU member states working on skills demand and international organizations. Uh, 
why we are promoting this uh, network is to bring experts and researchers together from different institutions, countries and specializations and co-create, exchange, disseminate labor market research to foster the culture of skills anticipation and match. In our, in our strategy 2027, we uh, aspire to be a uh, reference, uh, a knowledge gap, a reference in, in the world on uh, this area of uh, human capital development. And but to do that, we said uh, we don't want to, to be the best in the world that everybody comes and, and learn how much you, you are. No, we want to do that together with everybody. We want to capture and give uh, a place and a, and a forum to everybody who is working on this field in the countries. And that's why we, this idea of a network came from the very beginning. So this is done following a logic of partnership. And this is in, in line also with the idea that brought forward the, by the European Commission in its relation with countries surrounding the EU. The greatest impact in countries can be achieved if countries and institutions collaborate following a partnership approach. Partnership has always been one of our key factors leading ETF work and even more now. So that's why it is included in our strategy. The setup of this network followed uh, your expectation as spread before, which uh, included the, uh, to be informal, so bottom-up, and loose structure, and independent nature. It is your network, and uh, up to you how to use it more proactively. While ETF is here to support and to facilitate this exchange. Thus, the network will become more effective if you, members, keep high level of proactivity, interaction, and exchange, I believe that this event will contribute to boost all these elements. The event of these two days will focus about foreseeing the unpredictable. It is a, a very uh, exciting uh, title. You will also be challenged with a hackathon where you will be asked to work together to find a solution to a given issue. I know it can be a very uncommon way to deal with problems but that um, are faced by our society, but it will force you to analyze issues and to find solutions to challenge and challenges that I'm sure are also challenges for your own countries and realities. It's, but it, it is possible to anticipate the future, and if yes, to which extent? By observing realities in our partner countries, we have seen that the future is determined by where the countries stand now, but even more by the actions that they take to determine the speed and success of the transition. Global drivers of change affect all the countries, globalization, aging, technological change, digitalization, climate change. Accelerated pace of change brings new economic and social phenomena. It leads to incremented volatility and polarization, augmented further by the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic and the world. The impact of technological change on the development and use of human capital is very intense and has been substantially uh, accelerated over the recent years. The ICT sector added value has expanded over years, particularly between 2020 and 2021. Industrial relations are deeply changing with a strong sectoral shift towards services and new policy directions towards greening of the economies. But we have also seen that some huge shocks, COVID, the, the Russian aggression to Ukraine, global financial crisis, could not be anticipated and have had a massive disrupted effect on all economies and societies worldwide. Given the high degree of uncertainty we are facing right now, individuals, institutions, and businesses need to develop the capacity to deal with greater complexity and learn to become interdependent. The set of skills uh, needed to face the challenges of work and life today have become more complex and they will become even more complex tomorrow. Empirical studies 
and foresight exercises su suggest that uh, we are shifting towards less predefined job categories with broader skills requirements and towards ones that tap into the unique potential of individuals. With multiple and longer careers, a higher set of cognitive and analytical skills, as well as stronger socio-emotional skills are increasingly needed. Lifelong learning will then become crucial to strengthen individual employability and to accompany social advancements. Competence requirements are also changing as more jobs become subject to technological change and digitalization assumes a bigger role in the areas of work and life. New jobs in the low carbon economy will require heterogeneous skills portfolios and a wider set of skills with multidisciplinary profiles gaining attention. For example, the T-shaped skills profiles are emerging, requiring individuals to combine core transversal skills, the, the horizontal bar of the T, with the specific skills needed for a job, the vertical bar. There is also people talking about comb-shaped uh, uh, profiles, combining deep knowledge in multiple vertical areas, not necessarily connected uh, between themselves. The EU has established a key competence framework comprising higher level cognitive and socio-emotional skills, which aligns with a common set of so-called 21st century skills. This indicates that we are moving towards a multidisciplinary branch of uh, skills combining technical skills and soft skills that people will need to succeed in the future. However, a bulk of new opportunities also exist. For instance, new opportunities in specific sector, economic sectors where there will be potential um, uh, for millions of jobs to be created. This is just the first of uh, several initiatives that we will be organized. I expect that this network will be able to generate value for you members and your countries, and that it gives new impetus to the value of research for good policy making. In ETF, we have always pushed for evidence-based policy making. We firmly believe that policies need to be built based on solid data and evidence. The role of the network is also the one of fostering research and ultimately support the, the use of findings to improve education, training, and employment policies in our countries. So thank you again for your presence and active participation, and I wish you a very successful and also out-of-the-box event. Thank you. Okay, me again. So thank you so much, Xavier. Uh, big thanks really to our director also for taking the time uh, for being with us. And actually before passing the floor to the real people who have something to say to you, in fact, I would like just to guide you quickly through the agenda of the day. Now you see you come after the breakfast, you are sitting down and say, oh, finally I can have a rest. No way. This is just for the first time where we want to set the scene, share with you some of the topics we think would be, in fact, beneficial for your work when it comes to the hackathon. So, what will happen in this one and a half day together? First, after me, there will be a few people talking to you in order just to inspire you a bit, and then we'll have a panel of people, as I said, just to set the scene on the really key topics we would like to discuss with you in these one and a half days. This is the network, the knowledge is not here, it's there. So actually, we really need to use your brains as much as we can. What we come in the afternoon is the hackathon. I don't know how much of you are familiar with the hackathon, but in any case, don't worry, we receive instruction and you will have to work, so be ready. Tomorrow, then we will have a nice dinner all together. And once done, tomorrow it will be really the presentation of the solution to the challenges coming from the hackathon together with the award, the big surprises for all of us. We'll try to put music. If actually, I didn't ask yet to Roberto, our guy from audio and video equipment, but I will ask to put some music just to energize a bit before, after, and during the hackathon. And basically, this is the, the agenda. So I just want you to be ready. 
that this one and a half hour, we just want to give you the feeling of being our guest. Then you will be actually really the drivers for change. I think that I can pass the floor to Francesca Rosso, who is, um, of course, a labor market expert in ETF, but also our captain in this adventure, the content leader of the network, and not only for that, but voila, the nameplate, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simona. Good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to see you today. I met some of you yesterday during the dinner. I see you are all here, so it means that for the time being, we are all on board. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with you this morning, and I'm very happy to be part of this uh, live event. And I really hope that the beauty of this place will inspire you, and also the fact that we have the opportunity to meet uh, old friends or to meet new friends. And I think that this can really inspire us not only individually, but also collectively. When we were preparing for this event, uh, we asked uh, ourselves, uh, what is the value of a network? Why should we embark in such an exercise? And of course, we all know the value of information in our societies. Uh, how important it is to share information, to access information, because that boosts our innovation, our knowledge, and it provides new ideas uh, and can be, of course, inspirational. But I also looked a bit in the web. I did some homework, let's say, and I found some very nice definitions that I want to share with you. According to Michael Page, which, as you know, is the very well-known global headhunting company, there are 10 main benefits of being in a network. And they include, and I just mentioned here, their abilities to strengthen business connections, to vehiculate fresh ideas, provide access to information, as I said before, but also build confidence, provide a different perspective, and develop last, long-lasting personal relationships. And then I also found some very interesting articles from organizations that support small businesses. And interestingly, I've seen that among the benefits of networks, they mention shared knowledge, opportunities, connections, and increased confidence again. And what is interesting is the idea that if you surround yourself with people who share similar drive and ambition, you are more likely to also move forward as a group. It's also interesting that being in a network can help sharing ideas and knowledge, which in turn help us seeing things from a different perspective. From a conceptual point of view, innovation of the network is granted by the fact that network members can collect ideas from the whole network. They can anticipate emerging trends. An advantage comes from being able to link the most valuable information from one group to another, with the possibility to exploit the combination of the information. However, in the long run, the ideal situation is the one in which the density of the connection between the network members increases, also directly, without the need of a central hub or a central mediator, which means that the idea Pass, are likely to pass between network members with the advantage that the network may perform better and have a larger scale impact. Indeed, the network density is directly related to its effectiveness. The more interconnections there are, the better the communication of new ideas between the network members. Everybody is talking to each other and we make sure that nobody with valuable information is isolated. But let me say something more. I think that what is more important is that the network is about people. And I think that we can appreciate this even more after two years of confinement. I think that this people-centered approach is what really matters. 
Networks are done of people, and the value of collaborative networks rely on the power of collaboration. It is not really about where we are today, but I think it's more about where we will be in five or ten years. And it's about nurturing the relationship. It's about nurturing the collaboration. And it's about taking and receiving. The most that can be done out of this network is really in our hands, collectively. The Skills Lab network of experts was thought, was created to fill a gap. The need to share information and to build on each other knowledge in a logic that fosters innovation to make change possible in the countries. As you know, and as our director has already mentioned, networks and networking have been a fundamental component of the ETF activities since its inception and are at the core of our working methods. A recent evaluation has confirmed that networks have been successfully used for knowledge co-creation, mutual learning and dissemination. And they were also very useful to establish personal and professional connections between their members to discuss the challenges and the situation experienced in our partner countries. In the context of the Skills Lab, this network was identified to establish more solid relation, relationship with the research community in our partner countries and beyond, to reach a better flow of information on emerging skills needs. And this is in line with our 2027 strategy, where knowledge co-creation and working with partners are key pillars of our methods of work. What is the role of ETF in all of these, you may ask yourself. ETF is a broker. This is not the network of ETF, but this is really your network. This is the network in the hands of the members of the network. We act as mediators and we are here ready to support you and also launch these activities. But let me really underline that what we will do, we will do it together. And it really depends on our collective commitment. So basically, the place where we want to be in a couple of years is really a community where network members are free to talk to each other directly, are free to discuss and to learn from each other. This is where we want to get. Uh, and I think that there is a lot of knowledge in your country. We have seen it throughout uh, our work. And this network wants to really give value to the knowledge that exists in your country and that exists in your organizations. What will we do, you may ask yourself. There are a series of initiatives that ETF will propose and we will discuss about that more in depth tomorrow morning. But there are some ideas such as the one of launching a call for innovative research proposals and also to do some joint publications. We also think of meeting regularly, either remotely or in presence, as today, because it's important, in our opinion, to share our knowledge and to reflect together about the solutions to challenges which, at the end of the day, are quite common, even in different contexts. But of course, as I say, we need your help to make it happen. We will circulate also newsletter, flash news, to keep informed about events, publication, activities in the different countries. But we could also think about organizing events in your country to have dedicated action with media or with institutions uh, to make uh, our own work known. But that, that really depends uh, on your own proposal. When we started last year, many of you said that the value of the network was based uh, in its informal bottom-up structure, in its capacity to link the research world to the policy making, and also in the capacity of bringing people together with different knowledges, uh, keeping this interdisciplinary approach. And then, of course, to increase the capacity and the interaction of the research community. And all of this holds true today. 
We welcome very much the presence here of all research center, all research center from almost all our partner countries, and also the presence of international organization and agency. Xavier mentioned that before, and I think that their presence is really a sign that also the international community has a keen attention to initiatives that foster cooperation in a logic of co-creation of knowledge. So everything is really open ahead of us. I think that's the exciting part of this path. Uh, but I think that the underlying principles of cooperation, additionality and value creation are really the one that can inspire our work. Thanks a lot to all of you for coming today, all the way here, for engaging in this journey together. Let's make it work together, because it can really work. Thank you very much. OK. So thank you so much, Francesca. So I think that I can call here on stage uh, Manuela Prina the head of uh, skills in, uh, in identification and development <laughs> unit, which is actually my unit in ETF, but I never recall the name. OK, that's human being. I don't know what Manuela she's going to talk about. Uh, well, she always brings some surprises. So actually, this is the keynote speech, but be ready for something very, very inspirational. So Manuela. I'm raising expectation very high, Bravo. so <laughs> you're welcome, Habibi. The floor is yours. Thanks, Simona. Good morning to all of you. First of all, I want to share that uh, you got me as a keynote uh, speaker because uh, we didn't find anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that's the reality. The team was desperate. And at the end, uh, you know, uh, they, say, they said, Manu, can you do it? Well, okay, they call me all, everywhere to talk, but you know that uh, the story says that uh, each prophet is welcome ev everywhere, but not in their own house. Well, in ETF is the same. So <laughs> the second is that uh, when they said uh, a keynote speech, well, I prepared myself for like a 45 minutes story, and then they said, no, 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 five minutes. Keynote speeches after COVID, it's five minutes max. Okay. And finally, they came to me saying, listen, you don't have to repeat what colleagues before you said. And you don't have to talk about what people after you we talk about. Okay. So that was, you know, the challenge. So um, I've been asked to be inspirational and provocative and talking about the future. What will be the future like? This is, I think, one of the most frequently asked questions in the world, but also by each of us. If we would have somebody here in the middle of the room, a fortune teller, or somebody who said, well, I can read the future, I can tell you what is the future like, I'm sure we will stop the discussion and just be in a queue asking this person to tell us what is uh, next. Um, and surely we don't want to look for a bad news, right? If we have a bad news about the future, we will just pretend this is not true. But if it's a good news, we actually keep it as something that will will be with us for the day or for our next choices. So this morning, I actually downloaded the horoscope for the day. And mine said, good vibes will be in abundance for you today. So I, I really feel good. I will tell you later what is my zodiac sign so that those who belong to this good vibe can also rejoice in the, in the horoscope. But there is a, a sign next to mine that says, uh, um, you will feel like you want to continue sleeping the whole day. <laughs> okay. I, give you a minute to check your own. I know that now you are curious to know what's on for you. The future is such an attractive subject, it triggers, of course, our interest. 
And what we are told about the future has definitely strong influence on us, especially if, if it's positive. Yes, I can do it. I'm very positive about it. But when it's negative, the reaction is different. We use it usually as a justification. Well, you know, it went bad because the fortune teller was saying it was going to be bad. So, okay, you know, it's not my fault. It's actually the destiny, it's my karma. And the result is that we don't take responsibility. We are put in fear. We disengage. We don't take action. We become puppets in the name of the future. Now, it's not different when we talk about skills. So here, I read you some of the skills horoscopes that we have developed in those years. And I just want to know how you feel about it. I read a few. I don't cite the source because, uh, I mean, you might recognize some of the statements that all of us have put on paper. The need for manual skills will decline. The demand for technological, social, and higher cognitive skills will increase. Thank you. We just killed the next best designer in the world. Another one. First is soft skills, but they are the most difficult to learn. Another, there should be a clear rise in the demand for individuals in managerial, business and financial occupations, science, engineering, care and health. Can you picture this? A world of virtual reality, metaverse and psycho people needing treatment after they get off the screen. What is the story we tell about the future of employment and the future of skills? Is a story of good vibes, empowerment, or it's scary? By the way, nobody talks about social scientists or employment experts or researchers, so my dears, you are all done for the future, <laughs> including myself. And try to find a plumber now well, good luck for 2040, because nobody talks about this kind of skills. So there is a huge responsibility that goes with predictions. <clears throat> we shape the effect on people. We hint to them to be the cause of the future, taking responsibility through good vibes, or using the future as an excuse excuse to disengage, not to even try to give up on their dreams before even getting started. So, we have responsibility on our predictions on the future of skills, because it's a mega horoscope about humanity. It doesn't matter very much how we get to the findings. We read cards, we look at stars, we use coffee at the bottom of our cup, we analyze numbers, we do huge participatory processes, we read the bottom of the sea. The result matters, unfortunately, and I say unfortunately, as all professions that look into the future, the world is full of fake futurists. And you know how you recognize them? Well, they are catastrophic. Whoever is catastrophic about the future is a fake. Because they put people in that situation of being in fear, of not taking responsibility, and thinking that they will just let it be. And the worst thing that can happen to an individual, a community, a company, a policymaker, is just to think, okay, let it be. I can do nothing about the future. So this brings me to the last consideration. Why do you want to know about the future? Why do you read horoscopes? Why are we so passionate about 
telling to the world what is the future of skills? Well, because we want to be happy. And we want humanity to be happy. We want societies to be happy, to be green, to be inclusive, to be equal, to be just, to be fair. So when we know the why, we also know that we need responsible people. We need people who take action to make this happen. And to give people responsibility, we need to give them news and data and information that make them take action. So, let's focus on predictions with good vibes. I'm sure this uh, will help all of us to help policymakers, employers, educators, individuals to take responsibility for the future, to take action. Because this is the world we want. And this is our role as policy shaper, as researchers, to contribute to this positive future. Enjoy those days together and read your horoscopes. <laughs>
Actually, somebody said, I, it was Steve Rivkin in my notes, the more unpredictable the world is, the more we rely on predictions. Maybe this is just human reaction to the, to the uncertainty. It's um, the best future still, as, as mentioned also by others, is the one we create for ourselves. Um, that means that all these changes will not only create challenges, but also creating really today as well opportunities. It is at the end of the uh, day up to us how to take these opportunities, bring them further to create our own future. So managing transition towards the future for ourselves as individual, individuals, also for um, ourselves as countries, as societies, how we move from today to the future. Now, I don't want to take too much of your time because we have very limited, strict time, as you heard from uh, our colleague Simona. You see that. If this is in Italian, you are afraid. <laughs> <laughs> But the objective of this panel is, uh, is really to exchange views and, and experiences on how we deal with this uncertainty and, and also to find more positive ways in grasping the opportunities of the changes. And that's why we, we brought together uh, different uh, organizations and uh, countries together, all with excellent expertise and experience. So I would like to start with my questions to this panel, if you allow me. Now, um, I would like to start with um, Stavrola from Eurofund. Um, I, uh, you may know uh, Eurofund is another EU agency, like ETF, working on working conditions. Uh, you will mention more clearly. But uh, one thing they do very regularly and with very interesting results is working conditions survey in Europe. And they investigate how the different ways of work organization um, uh, lead to different uh, work engagement skills development. Currently, they are working on exploring the future of telework and hybrid work in the post-COVID world. So I would like to ask you, what are the preliminary findings of this um, study? Uh, what is the, effect, uh, the future of telework and hybrid work? Very simple question, really. <laughs> but first of all, uh, let me say thank you so much for the invitation and congratulations on this uh, magnificent event. Um, my horoscope, Manuela, Actually, it says to, for me today, I'm lucky. I feel lucky because I'm in a room full of very inspiring people, uh, interesting people who would like to make a change in the future. They are here because they are interested about the future. They want to make this change, all of us today. So that's really, that's really interesting. And I'm really, I really feel lucky. So um, I come from another EU agency, uh, Eurofound. We are based in Dublin. Uh, we are, uh, we've been there for many, many years, decades, and we are looking into research in uh, working conditions, uh, industrial relations, employment, social policies, and, uh, and so on. So um, you started already asking me about the working conditions survey. Perhaps I could start with this by saying that uh, in the last wave we carried out in uh, 2015, uh, this is a survey that is uh, carried out with work, you know, we ask workers about their working conditions. So in 2015, we, also, we asked them a question, several questions, and we wanted to investigate more clearly about the relationship between the association between a high employee involvement and skills acquisition. So what we found is that actually skills acquisition is very much associated with employee involvement and the, and the work organization systems that are in place in, in, the, in the workplace. We found that you know, skill development is higher in consultative and also uh, high employment work organization systems. 
And of course, our interest was, uh, among other things, in teleworking. So back in 2015, we found that you know, about 12% of people were teleworking at the time. And then the pandemic came in 2020, 2021, 2022, and then we saw that this was skyrocketed. You know, the number of, particip of people who worked from home, who teleworked, you know, skyrocketed. And of course, this tendency, you know, we have another e-survey that looks, looks into that. At the beginning of the pandemic, it was very high, but as the pandemic progressed and we came to 2021, there were fewer people uh, working from home. But what we noted was interesting is that, you know, preferences, people's preferences changed. There were more people saying that we want to work more, uh, every, uh, telework more, work from home every day, rather than, you know, the ones that, you know, said that at the beginning of the pandemic. And who is likely to telework, really? Uh, if you look at the data from 2019, then you will see that those people are mostly managers, professionals, uh, they are scientists, they are, you know, um, technicians, sales people, and so on. Um, so we notice that we have, the preferences have changed. People want to work uh, more often from home. But, you know, we wanted to also to see what are the drivers for telework and hybrid work. What drives, you know, higher uptake of telework and hybrid work? Um, so what we did is, you know, we looked into the literature, we looked into, into the data, and we wanted to develop scenarios. Uh, we wanted to see what the future will be for these types, uh, these forms of work. And so what we did is that we created a panel, a panel of experts. We included stakeholders, we included social partners, governments, we included the European Commission, other researchers, and we uh, uh, organized several, pa three, four panels where we discussed together the drivers, what are the drivers, what is their impact, and what is the uncertainty of those uh, drivers, and then, let's, then we invite them to develop scenarios with us together, rather than us as researchers saying, oh, we know everything, now we're going to tell you what the future will be. No, we didn't, that wouldn't make any sense in the real world. So, um, the scenarios basically, just to say that, I need to say that at the beginning, they are not predictions. They are not there to predict the future, to tell you this is going, what is going to be like in the future. And you may have heard already uh, as well that, you know, Niels Bohr, a physicist, a Danish physicist, said uh, predictions are difficult, particularly if they are about the future. And so, what we want to do with, the, with you know, the foresight exercise is to see what can be done today. What do we want to do in the future? How we can have the future we want and avoid the future we don't want? That's the purpose of this exercise. So, looking at the drivers now, the literature and, uh, you know, the existing uh, literature on telework and hybrid work, of course, there's very little on hybrid work. Uh, we ranked the drivers according to their impact. So the most impactful drivers, and this is a work in progress, I have never shared this information before, this is the first time I share this. We did this exercise, you know, on the last few uh, months and the last workshop la was last week. So you're the first crowd that is listening to that. So the drivers, you know, the more impactful are, you know, the nature of work how work is changing, how we are doing, our, how we are conducting our tasks, uh, our jobs, what kind of tasks, how we do the tasks, how we plan them. Do we have autonomy in the way we do our tasks and our jobs? Uh, the sequence, what goes first, what go, goes after, um, and so on. Um, we did some analysis with GRC as well at some point, you know, a few, a few, a few months ago, and we realized we saw that 37% of tasks, you know, are teleworkable. We don't, we don't telework, we don't use those tasks in that way, but there are, there is a huge potential over there. And of course technology helps, because, you know, technology, if, you, if it's used in the right way, it's not panacea, but if it's used in the right way, then it can make our work uh, easier, and some of the tasks can be done from home. Another driver is crisis. We saw the pandemic, but, you know, it's not only that. There might be other crises. There might be socioeconomic challenges that we may face in the future. Uh, energy crisis, uh, the, green, uh, the green, the climate science uh, crisis. Um, 
other, other drivers include people's mindsets, what people think about you know, the way we work, what society thinks about the way we work. Is this the right way? Do we want to work nine to five all the time and always from the, from the office? Or do have we changed our views? What do the managers think? Do the managers think that, you know, we lose, they lose productivity if people work, uh, you know, from home? Do they feel that, you know, there is less commitment or more commitment? Similarly, workers are also having, you know, their own, their own ideas about, you know, work-life balance, about well-being, and so on. Uh, regulation is also important. What kind of regulation? How we set uh, our regulation? Uh, is, are we consulting, you know, all the relevant parties for with the regulation? Technology as well, investments. Do the governments and businesses together invest in, let's say, hubs, uh, remote hubs where workers can go instead of going to the city center that's often very congested, crowded, uh, busy. Um, and then housing prices, rental prices are also part of it. I left the skills for the end because they are also important. Skills, I'm getting there, got the message. Skills are very important, digital skills, but also organizational skills, and the way we organize our work. How we organize our work, how we work together and, and differently. So the scenarios, um, we have several scenarios. So the scenarios I've selected to share with you today are three. The one is called, the so-called, a hybrid workforce in an equitable world of work. It's a mouthful. Uh, so what we see there is like, you know, uh, we have, we are in 2035 and the world is full of crisis and we survived in Europe, we survived the crisis, the crisis and we have come up, we have emerged more resilient. So we see that both companies and workers appreciate the mutual benefits uh, of telework and hybrid work. Uh, companies prioritize training, there is more work autonomy. And, uh, you know, uh, people have the skills to organize the work on their own way and their management skills. Another scenario, second scenario, would be something that we call a telehybrid work as a privilege. This is an asymmetric world of work. So, again, what happens is that there is, uh, there is telework, but what happens there is that not everybody has access, only some people, a selected uh, uh, crowd. And lastly, the last scenario is this training uh, hybrid work where we have recessions, we have a recession, and we also have an energy crisis. In that scenario, it's very difficult to motivate people. It's, uh, you know, there are uh, situations where, you know, there is skepticism, uh, business is very much restricted, and there is a more control and command, command environment. Right, what does this mean? I'm coming to an end. This means for the social partners, for the governments, that they need to take action today. Like, you know, for the governments, what kind of regulation, the, the, the companies, what kind of uh, work organization environment they want, and of course the workers, how they promote more training. And the training providers as well, you know, they need to uh, reassess uh, how they do uh, their training courses. So lastly, you know, just to say that work is very important for all of us and we need to take this seriously and there are ideas how to improve work. Um, the, idea, the difficulty lies not in the new ideas, as you know, uh, John Cain said, but in escaping from the old ones, particularly the ones that do not help us, they are not beneficial for the organizations and for their well-being. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Staurola. <laughs> Well, what I get from uh, your speech is that actually there is no one result. Every country may have a different combination based on the decisions they make, it seems. Anyway, uh, okay, so I would like to turn now to my colleague, very dear colleague Tamar from Georgia. And I would like to ask you another question. Uh, you were Deputy Minister of Ministry of Education in Georgia when the pandemic hit the education system as a whole in 2020. And I know that you had to suspend all the educational activities for a while and in particular this was very detrimental to the vocational education and training because of the practical skills they need to um, practice. So, my question to you is, how did you respond 
to this situation, crisis situation, and also in relation with your experience, what you could do differently for the future. Thanks. Thank you, Mohan, for this question, for this opportunity. I greet you all uh, warm and special warm greetings I want to send to Ukraine, to our colleagues which could not join us today. Um, uh, indeed, it's a, the most uh, uh, important discussion in, uh, in our society today. We all feel that uh, the time flows differently after pandemic or during pandemic. We all have this strange feeling and uh, to some extent this is um, a restart and we, we felt that it was a time for restart and it was a good chance for us to, to change something and to do things differently. During the pandemic, we struggled a lot to, to handle all of this and to, um, to put things in different way. Um, but there are many, a couple of uh, findings or lessons learned which I would like to share with you. First of all, uh, in terms of pedagogic dimension, um, it was very hard for Georgia to, uh, to move uh, to, to the digital because we need to change everything, the curricula, the time frames, uh, the agendas, everything. Um, and we assumed that uh, teachers need new skills. They need new pedagogy skills uh, because um, even for the future, even for the face-to-face -face, uh, teaching, um, it's already, we are already in an era where students need a different motivation. They need to, we need to be creative and innovative to find a way how to, how to keep them with us um, and uh, how to uh, manage all this uh, blended learning. And we decided to keep blended learning and digital learning. Uh, but also here are some challenges related to quality because some of the schools um, are um, uh, using this uh, not in, in a, in a uh, right way always. Uh, also, uh, there, there, is, um, uh, there, is, uh, there were the challenges in the uh, administrative dimension, how to administer the school, how to, um, how to manage all of this. Um, and um, there was also the good lesson learned from, for all of us that the only uh, solution here is the uh, decentralization of the schools. So to, to give more autonomy to the schools because it cannot be managed, such situations cannot be managed centrally. So we, start, we uh, tried, but we could not make it because all the uh, challenges they faced, they were, were the local challenges and they had to do it by themselves. So it was a good lesson learned, lesson learned and we started decentralization policy. We now changing the funding system to make, give more incentives to the schools and to raise the autonomy. Even we are changing the structures of school to adopt uh, the, the operations uh, to, to the uh, findings we, we had. And uh, also, that there is a, another finding. We, we, uh, we found that we need extra additional services for our students, including psychosocial services, because there are a lot of disorders among youth, and we need to have in schools at least referencing services to identify the problems and to find solutions with the other partners. Um, and also we put a lot of emphasis on key competences uh, because these are the key, uh, key to this surv uh, surveillance and to the sustainability of, of uh, their, their future labor career. Um, and also we started the, uh, to introduce the extracurricular activities as one of the key good uh, solution for them to provide some clubs, arts, sports, uh, to support our kids, uh, our youth uh, in terms of um, their psychosocial stability and also to develop their um, key competencies. Um, then the next uh, point I have is the partnerships. So we found, uh, we, we found the value uh, of the partnerships in, in a different way. 
so schools uh, get already get used to, to partner locally with many different um, institutions, with health sector, with uh, labor uh, um, employment services. Uh, they, they, they started uh, to uh, to uh, more intensively partner with private sector because this was the only way to provide our programs work-based because the schools were closed, the sectors not. So they were creative to place all the students in the sector not to, not to stop the uh, uh, learning process. So it created, opened the new opportunities for them and they saw the real value of partnership and that's very important. And we saw this value of partnership not not only on the local level, but also on the governance level. And Georgia used this chance to fully reform uh, the governance sector because we, we, uh, we saw that um, the evolutionary slow development uh, mood um, and trend would not be enough to survive because country has to position itself in the new world, in the new order, um, in a strong way. So we decided to come up with the new innovative governance model and we take out, took out uh, the skills uh, ecosystem, we call it like that. We, we call this reform from from vocational education system to skills ecosystem. We took away uh, the policy uh, making agenda from the Ministry of Education and we created the new agency. It is called Skills Agency, uh, where, which is governed uh, by the supervisory board, uh, the six deputy ministers from many uh, ministries and six uh, business membership organizations. So uh, that means the owners of the skills policy are not anymore the education guys, but also the world of economy, the employment, regional development, etc. We thought um, we, uh, to, uh, we have the different view now, more holistic view on this policy. We have just started uh, only five months, uh, but we, we hope that uh, things go, will go faster. And what is important in here, what the, this uh, new model of governance is giving us the chance to speed up the processes, first of all, to speed up this cycle of qualification, uh, skills anticipation, from skills anticipation to qualification awarding, um, it, it goes faster and the, it, is, uh, it has the chance to increase the relevance uh, while the skills um, um, in, in this policy, the private sector has its place. And the most important is that we added the sectorial dimension. We are founding now the sectorial skills organizations, which will be not anymore the ad hoc councils, but real sustainable organizations, uh, co-funded also by the government. Thank you. Coming. Uh, yes, I'm coming to an end. <laughs> and um, it's challenging for me. So, and um, uh, this, this will give us the chance to introduce new methodologies of uh, qualification development and predict the future in a better way because as a small country, we struggle with gathering of the big data and we, we are now working with the Ministry of Economy to, and uh, uh, Labor to create the new uh, data warehouse, but it's long track. So we decided to have the shorter reactions together with the sectors and to shape the policies sector by sector and to be creative and come up with the uh, diversified mechanisms to approach those skills gaps uh, and challenges related to that. Thank you very much. I think I, I covered all the topics on time. Thank you. Thank you, Tamar. Well, if I have to make a point from your intervention, I think the emphasis on, is on flexibility, adaptability, as well as giving more empowerment to all the relevant stakeholders in the system. Okay, um, now I would like to move uh, to Claudia uh, because of the time constraints. Um, Claudia, you have been working for many years in this, on the skills anticipation issues in Austria, uh, both for national and international projects. 
and you have probably applied all the methodologies of skills anticipation uh, to understand the needs of the business employers in Austria or in all the EU member states, maybe at the regional level. So my question to you is, have all these changes in the world led also to the changes of using methodologies? Are the old traditional methodologies still valid or are they new, better ways of analysis of skill needs in the labor market? Well, obviously, in times uh, of rapid change, uh, when there are labor market turbulences, you do not have the time to wait for that international, biannually conducted large enterprise survey. You want uh, data sources that give you a picture of what is happening right now. And you want the results without much delay. And um, you want to have the possibility to look at the information at close intervals, so the data source should be updated at short intervals. You're also interested in more detail than traditional um, labor market sources can provide. So, um, at the height of the crisis, um, traditional labor market sources were a bit of a disappointment. Although they have many merits, they also have obvious deficits. It takes um, a lot of time to produce uh, international comparable robust data. Usually because of comparability, uh, information is provided at a rather high level of aggregation only. But what you need really is detail, because you also have to react at the regional level. You do not want to know, um, uh, get information only at sectoral level, you want to know what is happening to certain smaller segments of the labor market. Healthcare workers, for example, or people working in the logistics sector, or harvest workers. <laughs> um, so, um, you also realize that uh, certain traditional um, labor market indicators became deceptive. Look at uh, unemployment rates, for example. What do they mean in times uh, of um, short working schemes when people are not being laid off but kept on? You do not, well, some countries introduced something like uh, analysis of uh, hours worked actually by people to get an approximate picture of the inactivity rate in the population. Um, another um, indicator that became inceptive, uh, <laughs> deceptive um, um, insolvency statistics. What do they mean uh, in times when governments introduce massive tax deferrals? introduce subsidies and so on, you do not know how heavily impacted uh, the economy is. Um, so, um, you had to turn to um, data sources that are more current, um, accessible without much delay, even though they might have other deficits like um, lacking representativeness, uh, robustness, and so on. And here, um, big data comes into play, especially online vacancy data. But um, of course, it's not the panacea for everything. You have to combine it still with the old, the traditional sources for validating and also for supplementing. Um, what also changed during the crisis was that um, the audience, I think, um, of the, the recipients of labor market research um, became more diversified. The general audience, because everybody in the population basically was affected, uh, more people um, were interested in the results of our research. So you had to adapt the way how you communicate um, your information and um, 
during the times of pan the pandemic, uh, lots of um, national labor market um, services as well as international organizations introduced um, labor market dashboards, for example, where they communicated research results um, in an easily accessible manner. Infographics updated at regular intervals. Of course, at that time, um, it is very risky um, to stick your neck out of the window <laughs> and try to predict the next five or ten years. So um, it was already pretty challenging to understand what is going on right now. And I think it was wise to invest your energy into looking what's currently happening, maybe trying to look ahead for the next two or three months. But I think for serious forecasting, it is wiser to wait till things calm down a little bit. And then, um, now we're coming to the question, what is the, um, the mix of methods for the future and the data sources of the future? Uh, I think you should, as a labor market researcher, have a broad portfolio. You should know uh, data sources, what are the benefits, what are the difficulties, also about methods, which ones can produce quick but maybe a bit rougher results, which can produce robust, internationally comparable information. And depending on the research question and your audience, you have to combine it. And that's nothing new. I think <laughs> the pandemic, pandemic mainly highlighted the desperate need for more current information. That, that's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Claudio. Claudia. Brava, Claudia. Two minutes in advance. I love you. Love you, love you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, well, my, ta uh, my takeaway from your intervention is that, well, there are new opportunities coming from the big data, but we still have to combine old and new sources of information. Better to use more uh, tools than only one. And we have to, we also need more real time data. Basically, thank you, Claudio. Claudia, sorry for that. I I'm, I don't know what is happening to my tongue. I didn't want to say Claudio, but I say it. Okay. Now, I want to turn to our uh, last speaker for this panel, uh, Michele Filippo. Uh, he is from this university, responsible for uh, undergraduate courses. Uh, University of Gastronomic Science. Um, well, you hear so far lots of things have been said on the future, uh, automation, uh, interaction between men and machines, all these fancy technological developments. But there are also other jobs which are much more traditional but also very much linked to the cultural heritage or even our daily life for our communities, such as agriculture, uh, food, craft sector. So my question to you is how can innovation be matched with tradition in your sector? I mean, gastronomy. And was the, the slow food movement uh, an innovative reaction to these, all these changes. What can you tell us about? Okay, first of all, welcome all. This is a great pleasure for us uh, to have you here in our campus. Unfortunately, this is a quite peculiar moment because uh, most of our students are in exam sessions, so they are pretty much uh, me up. But they are live. They are around, you're gonna see them uh, uh, let's say, facing the everyday life of uh, surviving to the exams. So if you see them uh, quite shocked uh, in a way, it's not for you, it's, <laughs> don't worry. Um, so, welcome. Uh, this is a, a university, a small university, and I use it as a case study. Uh, so it's not just because I lo uh, love to admire my navel, but rather because it's a, a small university that, uh, thanks to the size, uh, was a quite... Uh, fast in adapting to the different changes that we have faced in the past days. First of all, I have to say that looking at uh, gastronomy, that means uh, 
everything related to food, so the agri-food sector plus Eureka, let's say. Uh, the last two years were an acceleration of something that was already there. So it's not a revolution, it's not a, a turn of a page, but rather it's an acceleration we just keep a, a 10 chapter, something like that, in two years. That's what happened. So what is innovation in this sector? Well, first of all, it is uh, always about sustainability. Sustainability that is for sure environmental, but more and more it's clear that it is a social and cultural uh, aspect are relevant. And indeed, uh, looking at the record, first of all, we recognize that there is uh, a call for tradition, a call for local product, artisan products, low product, if you want. So, what is innovation in this uh, sense? Uh, uh, for sure, we have to recognize that uh, we are facing a, a quite strange situation. We are talking about farming 4.0, industry 4.0, and I love it. Uh, but uh, this is uh, for generally large-scale production, so industrial farming or industrial food production. It's not uh, for small production. And I have to say, this should be food for thought, because uh, first of all, uh, I think that uh, all the innovation, technological innovation, are important also for the small scale producers in uh, relieving them of uh, some aspect of their job, not substituting them for sure. But at the moment, uh, technology, let's say the tech industry is looking at a scale that is not the scale of reality of uh, most of uh, food production in Europe. So, uh, we have uh, to rethink about uh, what is uh, uh, sustainability and how to reach sustainability. Not just uh, looking at, uh, at technology with loving eyes, uh, thinking that this is the only solution. So, uh, sustainability can be reached in different uh, methods and points. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, listening at the traditional uh, methods of production, not because we are some uh, form of nostalgia or believe in the golden age of never was before, uh, but because uh, we have to realize that uh, our uh, food sector relied on uh, a huge diversity in terms of uh, uh, biocultural uh, specimen that indeed were definitely fitting the landscape. So they required less input, they required easier uh, way of uh, producing, that means uh, a more reliable food production. Second of all, we have to rethink indeed the food sector per se. We realized that uh, 50 years of uh, common market mantra failed during the 2020 and failed pretty much uh, astonishingly thinking that uh, uh, countries, uh, Baltic states uh, faced uh, a uh, food shortage that was uh, something that was not there since uh, 20 years uh, and uh, other states were struggling with supply chain. This is, uh, became even uh, worse with the Russian aggression uh, to Ukraine and what came after. So we have to reshape the, um, the foodscape and this is something that is about also our skills. Our skills as a teacher, our skills in empowering new generation to think different in their job. So, what to do? Well, um, as I said, I'm speaking about this university as a, a case study. This is just my ambition, not more. So, it's not auto-celebratory, uh, for sure. But we try to expand uh, the curricula. Change the language of uh, master programs in particular, embedding the idea of sustainability, this three, uh, 360 degrees idea of sustainability into the program, like the two-year master in sustainable food innovation and management. We create a new uh, program in agricultural technique that are linked with agroecology, uh, or we uh, open a master in uh, heritage conservation not just because of uh, the love of documentation and creating a new museum of uh, old specimen, but rather to allow the new generation of uh, uh, protagonists of the food sector to be able to document uh, and uh, use and classify and use these resources that are around, resources that are tangible and intangible. So this is uh, actually what we try to do uh, is, uh, uh, let's say, move uh, along the change, try to anticipate, but with the fear that uh, indeed it's difficult to predict something that is going to happen in five days and not 
there to do it in five years. Um, slow food. Well, slow food is a slightly more complex story I need because it, uh, it's a movement, a cultural movement, political movement that uh, um, started in the late 1980s and the reaction to uh, the Green Revolution. The standardization of uh, species, varieties and products that the uh, Green Revolution brought to the food market. Um, in the course of the years, uh, of course, uh, this movement uh, raised awareness concerning the importance of food heritage in Europe, outside Europe. Uh, I mean, I'm glad to work in, uh, with case studies in Asia, in Africa, doing this uh, documenting work. So I can say it's uh, a world's uh, attitude at the moment. Um, in the course of the early 2000s, it formulated an idea of food uh, that is indeed uh, something that uh, Nowadays we can consider like trivial, but at the time was uh, somehow revolutionary, that is uh, good, fair and clean. So a product should be good and uh, palatable, but it should be also respectable uh, of uh, the environment and at the same time of the people that are working there. So bridging together the, the WFFO and uh, let's say the fair trade into an idea of a future that uh, start from peasant farmers, small producers. So, let's say, is indeed uh, a step forward. It brings with it uh, this idea that the past is beautiful, uh, for sure, but in the terms uh, I said before, in terms of the re uh, resources that, that come from the past, uh, and with uh, the idea that uh, we should forget this approach, uh, uh, let's say, abandon ourselves to technology, but rather to understand that technology, new advancement in technology and, uh, and mechanization can brings something new, something important, but otherwise we shouldn't forget our past. So let's say, I hope that I have an answer to your question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Filippo, Professor Filippo. Yes, uh, I, I love the word uh, 360 degree sustainability. It's really something that uh, brings us all to the small farm farmers and my takeaway from your intervention is that innovation is not specific to engineers, medicine, or ICT experts. I think innovation can happen in every and each sector, even in agriculture, the most traditional sector, and we still need that. Um, for that moment, I think I yes, stop here. Yes, so thank you so much. Time. I'm sorry for being really the bad cop, but I'm also a nice person, believe me. In, but in other circumstances. Okay, allora, uh, I really need your collaborations because we will have a very hectic coffee break. So, point one, I have a few announcements for all of us, in fact. Uh, I'm sure you have plenty of questions for our distinguished panelists. And you saw that for the moment you are not equipped with a microphone. This was done in purpose, to be sure that you behaved and you don't intervene like this and you, and you steal the time for the panelists. But after the coffee break, this is not the end of the panel, in fact. After the coffee break, we will have again our panelists back. We will have a, a final round of questions. Surprise! <laughs> and actually, you, there will be also some time for questions answer. Question and answer from you here in remote and also from our participants in remote following us via streaming. So the two questions we will have to balance a bit and this is first announcement. Now we have the coffee break but there is always a but in life. Before the coffee break we have the picture time and you might guess why the picture time if we have already such a short coffee break because our director is here so we want to take a picture with Xavier. You know there are many different elements coming it's difficult to put everything together. So question and answer later. Coffee break, yes, with a big butt. So I would ask uh, Daniela, Silvia, whoever can help, also our colleagues from Tree, to guide you. I think we take the picture in the garden. It will be you taking the picture, Christian? Could be, okay. Okay, we want to keep a bit of suspense. We have two minutes to do everything, but we, so in any case, in the garden, you are the, the most experienced to tell us where to meet. So I told you about the continuation. I know that we miss the Tour de Table. It's not that we forgot that for, if we talk about network, we need to know who we are. 
So don't worry, we will have time for this during the hackathon and we'll find ways to introduce each other. Take advantage of the coffee break to introduce to those who you don't know. Uh, what are you... Download? Ah, well, uh, this, uh, no one told me. Ah, okay. So, double surprise. We have a booklet where all our nice faces and our very super short, let's say, CV and patience for life. So, there is a QR code. It was too advanced for me. This is why I forgot it. There is a QR code. You download it and you see who we are. Otherwise, I guess there are printed copy. So, Three, two, one, go. We now all go in the garden, we take a picture, we benefit from the coffee break. For the streaming, we will be back here sharp at 11. We need to be very